I am very pleased and excited to announce the official launch today of the campaign for Nobel Prize recognition of the extraordinary global contributions of the Cuban Medical Henry Reed Brigade. Trained to assist in prevention and cure against the dead march of the coronavirus across the world. The campaign has been endorsed by many, including Danny Glover, Adolfo Perez Esquivel, Noam Chomsky, Alice Walker, former president of Ecuador, Rafael Correa, singer-songwriter Silvio Rodriguez from Cuba. That's just a few of them. And we already have 13,000 people have endorsed the campaign from all over the world. To endorse this new campaign that is launched today, you can go to cubanobel.org, cubanobel.org. Now to this evening's special webinar and our very special guest, we have Cuban ambassador Jose Ramon Cabañas, and worldwide engaged U.S. citizen, artist, human rights, and social justice advocate, Danny Glover. Over the next um, hours, Cabañas and Danny, Ambassador Cabañas and Danny, will have a conversation about COVID-19 and Cuba commitment to global welfare, exemplified in the Cuban government now well-documented long-standing coordination of successful medical brigade and their ability to be able to respond to medical and natural disasters requests from the most underdeveloped and desperately underprepared countries to the most resource-rich developed countries. Let's open the conversation by asking Ambassador Cabañas to talk about why Cuba is so prepared by comparison to most other countries to offer his healthcare achievement to the world. What principles or national convictions have guided Cuba to this global humanistic assistance, even to countries that oppose Cuba or blockade free, and com uh, free trade and commerce with your country? Well, uh, thank you, Alisa. And hi, Danny, and all participants. How are you doing, Ambassador? Fine, thank you. Uh, uh, well, uh, first, thank you for launching this uh, campaign that, uh, of course, we will follow from Cuba with uh, interest. Thank you for the, your support in, in, in this time. And thank you for all the solidarity work you have done. I mean, all the organizations around this webinar you have done in, in the past. My regards to all the participants. We know, we, we see we have many right now. And hopefully the conversation during the next hour would please all of you or will be of interest of all of you. Now, in regards to, to your question, uh, Alicia, which is a very broad question, I, I would say, uh, first, we, we, have, we have to keep in mind how we were born, born as, as a nation. And we have to keep in mind why the Cuban revolution happened. I mean, 60 years ago, we had a situation, uh, particularly in this sector, I mean, public health in Cuba, when we had only 6,000 physicians on a population of 5 million people. Uh, public health was uh, something related to urban areas mainly. In the countryside, it was very difficult to have access. And uh, public health was not a human right as it is uh, today. Uh, remember that uh, we, uh, uh, during the process of independence, uh, I mean, the, the fight against Spain, the, the colonial power, and even the, during the Cuban Revolution, we received the support of many, many internationalists uh, from many countries. Uh, the, the brigade that is now supporting uh, the contingent and uh, different brigades supporting many countries uh, in, in the whole world, named after Henry Reeve, who is an American hero, uh, brigadier general, who supported uh, the freedom fighters in Cuba against Spain then we are born as, as a nation with the support and the presence of uh, and the influence and uh, our nationality is uh, was uh, built on our African roots on, on the first hand uh, European roots uh, and we, we we feel that we have received influence and, and we have uh, 
many routes from all over the world. Our national hero, Jose Martí, he said many times, for Cubans, homeland is humankind. Then we really believe, uh, the Cuban revolutionaries always believe that uh, we are just one people. I mean, th all those divisions about races and, and those differences, we come from the, first, the, the same place. We have the same needs, the, the, the same challenges. And we have, to, we have only one boat, which is the Earth planet. And, and that's it. I mean, we, we cannot live from where we are. Then we, uh, our ancestors uh, and, and our patriots, always believe in internationalism. Uh, but again, going back to our national situation, 60 years ago, the revolution was fought to, to change the status quo in, in, in Cuba. And uh, from very early in the process, to create the, the human resources to provide public health for a population that was growing and is nowadays 11 million people, was, was a priority in, in the process. Very early in, 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 during the revolution, we sent the first uh, brigade to help others in Nigeria, early 60s. And since then, we created uh, faculties of medicine all over Cuba. We started to, to welcome foreign students uh, in Cuba. Uh, nowadays, large numbers of, of students have uh, graduated in Cuba. And uh, particularly, since uh, 1998, after the Mitch uh, storm, uh, in, in Central America, for, for many years, we were receiving students from abroad. But at that time, our President Fidel Castro said, well, how are we able to create those human resources in those places where they are needed? Because we can help when they have a, a problem, but they need local resources to be resilient to regular diseases to be resilient to face natural disasters and, and so on. And then that year was created the Latin American School of, of Medicine, uh, which is not Latin American anymore because we have students from 115 countries, including the United States, uh, 200 of your physicians that are currently fighting COVID in the United States were graduated in Cuba. And as we speak, almost 100 uh, young students are uh, in Havana as well, uh, to graduate from medicine. Then we have received in that school, as I said, thousands of, uh, close to 30,000, uh, the figure of a student from, from many countries. And then we have created those capacities for ourselves and we have created, we have helped to create capacities uh, for, for human resources uh, for other countries. In, in cases like Gambia, uh, I remember Several years ago, Gambia, as an African country, never had a faculty of medicine. And, and Cuban experts created that, that faculty, and nowadays they, they are able to graduate the, the, their own uh, physicians. Then we are, we are able to do that because we believe, as I said, that public health is a human right, that uh, you have to provide that possibility to, to your whole population. We don't believe that uh, public health is a commodity or is something that you can buy and sell like any other uh, product. Uh, we believe that government has a, a commitment or should have commitment to provide uh, that, that service. And, and by the way, for free. I mean, we, 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 we are born with those uh, needs and, and it's uh, for the government to, to provide that kind of service. And why? Do we do, do we do that globally? Again, we do that globally based on our principles, the kind of people we are, the ideas that we have followed uh, even before the revolution, but certainly after the, the revolution. And we hope nowadays, as you know, we are the country with the highest rate of physicians per, per inhabitants, and nine physicians per a thousand inhabitants in, in Cuba. Uh, and we will uh, continue that. We, we are a, a, a people of givers, and, and then uh, public health is one of those services we, we, we are able, and we will continue to provide. And in, in some specific communities, like, like Caribbean, when you live in, in, in a Caribbean country, as we do, uh, we, we certainly believe in, in the value of, of doing collective things. I mean, in the Caribbean, you are definitely a community. Uh, 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 
the members of the Caribbean community and small countries not favored by modern nature with uh, natural resources, then our main resources are human resources. Uh, we are impacted by hurricanes every year, as you know. We have to face uh, climate change. Then our, our aim uh, is to, to help each other. The only way the Caribbean countries can move forward if, uh, if we help each other. By the way, the last brigade that departed from Cuba to help others departed to uh, Turks uh, and Caicos, which is, as you know, a British overseas uh, territory. But we believe it's, it's part of the, of the Caribbean uh, family. Ambassador, uh, that's an extraordinary history that you just laid out. Uh, and, and when you think about the, where you are now at this particular moment in this, this historic pandemic, this, began, this process began 60 years ago. Certainly, one of the things that you would have to, have to identify is the capacity, the human capacity available to you. And that is, because there weren't resources, except human resources available to you. So you began a literacy program. In some sense, and then you began an educational foundation as a result of the literacy pro program and began to say, this is what we need right now in building our capacity as human beings. In the first stage of, of, of independence, in this first stage of self-identity self and also the first stage of your own sovereignty, you said you made yourself self-sufficient with literacy then an educational, an educational programs in which you can utilize that now that aspirations, those aspirations, and build this medical service. That is extraordinary in the sense that this medical service has been in, in, in place and continues to grow, continues to be enriched by not only the capacity of Cubans, but also the capacity of others around the world. For instance, those who attend, uh, attend the medical school, the Latin American School of Medicine, and, and, and I had the, the advantage of coming to with Havana on the 20, on, the, on, the, on uh, July of last year at the invitation uh, to, to witness the graduation of more, more than 190 students from the Gambia, as you mentioned before, from Mozambique, from South Africa, from Caribbean and from the Caribbean and Latin American, Latin America, I had the advantage of, of being there and witnessing all these students now who were going to take what they learned there, including Spanish, yes. and use that in transforming the whole idea of medical care and, and health care in, in, in their, own, uh, their own countries as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you, you are almost a godfather for those uh, kids there. You have visited them so many times, particularly the the group from from United States, but it's it's, it's exactly as 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 you said. I mean, uh, at the land you have a, a large community of uh, young kids from from different cultures, and when you ask them, of course they learn about medicine in Cuba, but they learn how to to live as a community, receiving the the, the influences of of others, learning from others, sharing the the knowledge uh, they have. And, and it's important because uh, when we talk, well, we refer to Henry Reef uh, brigades and, and uh, uh, remember that it was created back in 2005 during the Katrina uh, hurricane when Katrina impacted the United States in New Orleans and, and, New Orleans and you had uh, 1,800 casualties. Well, the, 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 the brigade was created at that time precisely to help the United States. No, no any other country, bad. Uh, United States. And since then, it, it has uh, grown and, and, and they have been to, to many, 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 many countries. But, but going back to, to your, your, your idea, uh, the way those resources I created, the, the, way, the way they learn collectively about medicine and to be resilient, uh, a piece of history that is missing many times is how those kids they got together, for instance, when uh, Haiti was affected by the earthquake back in the year 2010, many of them 
created an international brigade and they went to Haiti. Uh, and they came from many countries, including the United States. Then at that school, you educate, if you wish, or at least you, you share that sentiment of internationalism. Yes, yes. Internationalism, solidarity. I, I, I had an opportunity uh, to be a part of a, a, a beautiful film, a warm, wonderful film, uh, which was produced by Gail Reed, Salud, a wonderful view telling that story uh, about the Cuban health service and, and the way that at every corner of the island itself, it provides the service, the, the, the highest levels of service, service to all citizens. And to be able to think about and navigating and, and, and what a vision, to have a vision and be seeing that vision and grow and grow and grow and find other expressions as well as we've seen it in, in other countries that there's other expressions that have seen. And it's, it's something about the political will because that's all it becomes. It becomes the political will to at each particular stage map out a strategy in which you're going to, to ensure that the first thing that you say, first thing you say is that healthcare is a human right, not a privilege, but a human right. So that's the first, the first stage. And then to be to map out a strategy, a strategy that continues to kind of find new breath in everything. We understand, we know that, 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 that global warming and climate change is real. So we have to prepare for the kind of outcomes from that, that reality, the, the intensity of the storms, the, the tropical storms, the intensity of all the things that have a way of disrupting people's lives and to be prepared for that. And, and the examples of that, um, uh, amazing, amazing. As I've heard just often through the grapevine, uh, you know, the idea of what happened in, in Pakistan at the earthquake and, so, and how, how available not only the, the medical service, but they intentionally send, sent females a, a, who populated the, that, 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 that brigade, who populated because they understood and they gave, understood, not only stood, but also, also respected the culture in which they were going into, that they were entering into. And those are the kind of things that it takes another, a level of sensitivity, but it also takes a level of building the kind of internationalism as we see now. And certainly the internationalism that's, that where the, world, where the world has to act because it's not since an issue in, in the United States, and not since the issue of the COVID-19 in, in China, but everywhere, everywhere. And yet we've yet to even to discuss about what, what is happening and to what extent it's happening in Africa itself. We don't know the dynamics about that, it's a, but I know that that is as you were with Ebola and, and as you were at other times, you were there to provide the services and, and, and really create and imagine, if we can imagine, create the kind of communities in which communities have their own, like I feel their own sense of viable uh, transactions between among themselves and see, building their own confidence, and I'm and I'm imagining and I'm seeing building those own confidences, confidence and everything. And imagine all those physicians who come in, who graduated and gone back to the continent of Africa, which I have to be very fond of, every place that I've been there, and to use those skills in the service of building the community and translating those values. It's all about a set of values in terms of translating those values to building their own model of service and own commitment to what we need to have as, as something, in, as a worldview. Absolutely. Uh, you covered several topics and many things are coming to my mind now. But let me uh, go back to something you said before, which is political will. It's, it's impossible uh, to have and uh, to build a comprehensive uh, system for, for public health without a political will. Yeah. Without a political will to have large percentage of your budget dedicated to that, without the political will on, on every layer, I mean, from the national uh, level in our case to, to local uh, government, 
and the way those uh, human resources interact with each other. And let me be clear on that. Beyond that education, I mean, you can have a good professional, uh, beyond the, the political will and, and the resources, we have been able, and, and, and that happens for us, and probably is useful for someone else, but in our case, in Cuba, we have built over the, over the years a very complex system, but just one system for public health. Mm -hmm. Based on, on the family doctor level, as you know, is, the, is that expert that is living in the community, with the community, teaching the community, following the principle that a physician visits a person not because he or she is sick, he mm -hmm. could be potentially sick, and the information that you gather is, is important because you are able to foresee what could happen in mm -hmm. a few years. For instance, among the many projects we, we have developed in Cuba, we have been able to create the genetic map of our country. And then we know in advance, and our system knows in advance, the kind of diseases that the family will develop in 5, 10, 20 years based on the, the information we have been able to gather. Mm -hmm. In Cuba, that system, uh, based again on, on the family uh, doctor level, uh, is, 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 is intertwined, is, is in, interconnected. I mean, if something happens in, in Guantanamo, immediately you, you, you will feel a repercussion in Pinal del Rio, which is the most uh, western uh, province in Cuba. And then, from the family doctor level, then you have community clinics, you have hospital, and you have the ministry, you know, the, and the different faculties of medicine uh, related to all of them. What we see in, in other countries is that they don't have just one system. And in many cases, they, they, don't even have, they don't even have a system. They have practitioners, they have clinics, but they don't have a system. And when you mentioned to be resilient, to climate change or other kind of uh, diseases or problems you have, you need that that system, I mean, every piece in the system, they, they are able to communicate with each other, exchange information. Uh, you go to countries where uh, people who talk cancer, they never talk to people talking about uh, heart diseases or, or brain diseases. No, it's, we are a human being. I mean, we, we are a system. And human beings, we are a system. Uh, whatever happens in your ankle will uh, impact on your shoulder or your lung. I mean, and then how, how you're in a capacity to, to deal with a patient, how you can provide uh, health or, or that service if the, the system is not uh, interconnected. You, you remember that three or four years ago, Cuba was recognized, recognized as the first country that st stopped transmission of AIDS and syphilis from mother to child by, by PAHO here in Washington, D.C. How a country can do that? Well, only with political will, human resources, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the kind of funds you, you need for that, but also having just one system of, of public health. In many countries, as I said before, uh, you, you, you can have one hospital and next door another hospital, but they don't uh, communicate. Uh, you mentioned also uh, what happened in, in uh, the earthquake in, pa in Pakistan. And probably is one of the best examples where if you don't have a, a humankind culture, uh, I mean, if you don't believe that we are all the same family, it's difficult to address uh, what yeah. you find. I mean, yeah. it's, it's like... Uh, uh, QS uh, has a different culture than Pakistan, religious belief, and the, the first impact, I mean, the, the first impression of our experts uh, uh, when they arrived, well, the, the community, and they were, by the way, very isolated community, they were not big, big urban centers, mm. and they were like, you know, uh, protective, uh, and they, they uh, at, the, at the very first moment, they were not that open. Mm. Welcome foreign uh, physicians dealing with uh, sensible uh, subjects. But a few days later, they went over religious belief and practices for, for many years. And mm -hmm. they were happy. They were grateful for the service that the Cuban experts uh, provided. But what happened by the end? 
hundreds of Pakistani uh, students came to Cuba to study medicine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now you have many physicians in Pakistan, mm-hmm. practitioners who graduated in Cuba, and they have a completely different view about health in general, about the world, and, and a, the kind of service that they can provide in their country and in the, in the Asian re- region as well. Uh, again, and, and, and going uh, to your, your third point on COVID, well, this pandemic, probably like, that, that, like never before, has shown everybody that the only way to have progress if yeah. is precisely if we interact, if we share knowledge, if we share our data with, with other people, if we uh, retrieve, I mean, if we withdraw and, and we are just on our national frontiers, and we, on our fences, it's impossible that we can defeat that uh, pandemic. Uh, you mentioned the, the example of, of Ebola. And it's a good example that, that I, by the way, that I mentioned in the United States several times. The only two countries, many countries send uh, resources to Africa, but the only two countries that send human resources, I mean experts, human beings to, to fight the disease were United States and Cuba. We cooperated on the ground, we were successful on the ground, mm-hmm. and the American population was grateful, and, and we, we saved, I, I think, many, many, many lives. You know, I was just thinking, Ambassador, just about when you mentioned the word courage and everything, and, and certainly, um, and I have my own stories, you know, uh, in, in terms of um, having a father who had um, had many health issues, and and one of those was that he had a kidney failure. I, I had to be had an opportunity to have a dinner on one occasion when I was in Havana uh, with with uh, Gail Reed, and, and also the the young man who was the head of nephrology for the whole country, and and I remember him saying, in, in that position. He was in that he had to to leave dinner early early because he had to make a journey to some other part of the country to check on to see to 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 do some work regarding those people not in Havana but those people who were in more, perhaps a more rural setting and everything he had to do that and he had to do that but I, I the one thing about that I said that well I wanted an opportunity to go by since I'd been, because of my father's uh, uh, issue. I, I went to, and I'd been by many places where there we, we had kidney ail- people had kidney ailments and they had to have dialysis and everything else. Let me see how you treat with the limited resources you have, with the, and I'm in mind you, the limited resources, how you treat citizens, ordinary citizens, with the tools that you have in helping them struggle through their kidney issues. And I was just amazed at, at, at how, how ingenu- ingenuous, you know, or, or the brilliance behind and, the, and the, the almost, you know, use of every single part of one's imagination to throw and to help those, those patients who depend upon you every three days, I mean, three days a week and everything else. So that was one of the experiences that I had that I was just very taken by, given that they weren't the kind of resources and equipment that we'd have in the United States, but the commitment to that and the courage to have a commitment. You have to take something away from yourself. You have to take divorce yourself from yourself of whatever, the, the, and, and to be able to have that spirit of generosity as a position to go anywhere where you need it. That kind of mentality, I don't know where this ever existed and in, 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 in it became the anthem for a nation like it has the, for the Cubans, uh, for Cuba and the Cuban people. Well, you're, you're right, as always, uh, Danny. And uh, uh, usually people think about medicine and the practice, as you said, related to fancy technology, equipment, and something like that. Uh, and they miss the point of the communication you know, between the physician and the patient, I mean, and the, and the, and the population. 
I, I, I believe that in some way, uh, a good physician has to be a good believer, you know. And, and that there is a set of principles to, to be a good physician. But beyond that, uh, as, as this experience you, you mentioned, uh, many people rely to, for the practice on, on the equipment. If you know a Cuban physician, then you will know a person that first talked with the patient or talked mm -hmm. to the patient. Because many, a, a lot of information comes out of a, a good conversation. And our, our uh, physicians are trained to go anywhere they go without technology, without fancy, fancy equipment. And through the clinical knowledge they, they can gather from the patients, the, the symptoms, Uh, we have many stories in remote places, not only in Cuba, but uh, all over the world, about Cuban physicians being able to produce a diagnosis simply by the knowledge they gather from the patient. And simply, not, not only information they, they hear from them, but with their hands, you know, they, they do a kind of uh, exercise. Uh, simply by that, they, they have been able to save uh, many, uh, many lives. And I, I was thinking... Uh, precisely in terms of communications, the, the kind of questions uh, they, they ask and how they can organize their the knowledge in order to produce uh, a diagnosis. Uh, we have a case of uh, bilateral cooperation uh, between Cuban experts and American experts in Chicago. Mm -hmm. in the year 2017, I mean, three years ago. Yes, sir. Under the current administration, not the previous administration. Of course, the idea came uh, well back from the two, uh, year uh, 2015 and 2016. But finally, the Cuban experts were able to come to Chicago, Illinois, uh, uh, by the mid-2017. Uh, with the support of the, the state of Illinois, the support of the, uh, the local government in Chicago, I mean the city of, of Chicago at the time, and a private uh, foundation. Mm -hmm. What they learned, I mean, they are experts, they, they came to share their knowledge, but also to learn, of course. They were not dealing directly, uh, they, they went through the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Illinois, and they were not dealing directly with the patients. But if we were talking about human resources, we were talking about political will, uh, budget, the kind of system you structure. Well, they, they learn a lot about how to bring that knowledge to the community because they were accompanying local experts in Chicago to do the kind of research and to do the kind of polls they, they, they do usually. In, in that case, uh, in Inglewood, one of the low-income communities in, in, in Chicago, and the kind of uh, polling they, they do in Cuba uh, usually. And I remember listening from them, they were visiting a, a pregnant lady. She, she was almost nine, nine months uh, of pregnancy. And the first question they, they asked, they, they, they were accompanying the local experts in Chicago. They asked first, when was the last time you, you visited a doctor? And the lady said, well, nine months ago, when I was told I was pregnant. And, and, and they said, well, that's impossible. I mean, in mm -hmm. Cuba, as, as long as we have a pregnant woman, you have regularly, it's like a religion. You, know? you have to go through every test. You have the visit of the family doctor and so on. And the second question was, when was the last time you, you visited your dentist? And even the, the American experts that were the, with them, they, they look at them and Why do you ask that? <laughs> and I said simply because for a pregnant woman, most of the diseases they, they, they can take come through the mouth. I mean, the, the, the first thing you, you have to, to check is yes, exactly. how, yes, how your, your mouth health is. And uh, they were impacted just for those first uh, questions. But, and they, they went on. By the end, by the end, What we learn, I mean, what learn people in Inglewood, what, what we learn that if, and, and by the way, they, they normally accompany the, the, the experts, the local experts, they went through the religious leaders in the community, they went through the leaders in that, and the families, 
uh, they have you have your own rules and you have your, your your own regulations about private information and and so on and what is privacy what is not but the point is unless you have that system mm -hmm. part of, of the inform the information that is produced locally it's impossible uh, to uh, to provide a, a good uh, public health and and the other topic is if you teach if you educate the local Uh, population, if you educate the community, the community itself will will protect itself, will be able to, to let you know what is what is going on in advance. Yeah. Because yeah. it's like a hurricane. I mean, you are not prepared. You, you, you cannot be prepared the same day that the hurricane is taking place. You have to, pre to be prepared in advance. And only by teaching and educating people, there are national cam campaigns on different diseases, how to teach people and how to educate people to identify symptoms. And, and it's, it's not a last resort uh, thing. I mean, it's, if they are able to, uh, to share their knowledge and, and to tell the physicians beforehand, you know, I'm feeling this probably, uh, I'm doing that, the kind of food you eat. I mean, simply by educating the population, you can accomplish uh, many things in, in very... I mean, not as a sophisticated education in, in health in general or in medicine, but mm -hmm. simply some some principles. We, 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 we've talked about so many of the successes that the Cuban Health Service has experienced. What, what are some of the challenges that you felt and, and why, how the ways that you were able to overcome those challenges, as, as, as I may say? So we talked about literacy, education, building the framework for, for, for doctors to not only aspire to be doctors, but, at, but uh, with the skills necessary to follow their, their, their career path. But what are some of the other things that, that we can talk about in terms of overcoming? We know, we know that, that you, you have a, an extraordinary tech section, sector, in which you develop drugs, the hepatitis and, 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 and other things as well. We know that. And, and, and on the cutting edge of that as well. But, but some of, the, some of the, the great successes also come with many of the challenges as well. Talk about some of those challenges. Well, I know one is trying to keep it afloat given the current political situation and the fact that there's been a, 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 a sanctions and an embargo on Cuba, but without that. And so it's, it's, almost, it's, it's almost you titillate with the idea of what it would be Like have not those been in place for the last 60 years as well, but talk about some of the other things as you as you as you think about the history of this this history as well. As you said, after a challenge, then you have the outcome, you know, and, and you have the the, the results. Uh, the, uh, our first challenge uh, 60 years ago was was the amount of physicians we had in Cuba. Uh, as I said, we had 6,000 in a population of five, five million, millions. Uh, United States at the time, the government created the program just to uh, have a, a brain drain of physicians to United States. That amount of 6,000 was cut by half. Then uh, in the early 60s, we became to, to have uh, 3,000 physicians. And then the challenge and the response to create the human uh, uh, capacity you know, to, to face mm -hmm. that. The literacy campaign, as you said, uh, the revolution from the very beginning believed and that uh, the only way you can have human beings being part of the political process is if they are educated. I mean, if they, they know how to read and write, if they know how to express the, the concerns and how to be part in that uh, political process. In uh, uh, Formerly, we had two faculties of medicine in Cuba, one in Havana, one in Santiago, Cuba, the, the third one in Villa Clara. Uh, and we, we came from having two or three higher education uh, institutions to have 57 in uh, 60 years uh, later. Uh, and uh, on every province, we have 15 provinces in, in Cuba. On every province, we have at least, and in many cases, more than one, one higher education Uh, institution, being a, a university itself or even a faculty, depending on uh, the economic uh, characteristics of uh, every mm -hmm. of every province. But 
and and of course being a third uh, a third world country under developed country yeah we have limits in terms of technology resources uh, all of that but you mentioned the most important limit we we face these days and we have facing for almost 60 years now to to develop further our, our uh, country resources being humans or technologically speaking uh, which is the, the blockade what you call embargo in the United States and we call uh, blockade before going into that idea let me let me go to the back to the 80s when uh, Fidel Castro uh, dream and, and uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez said he visited the future and he returned to let us know about the future and to explain about the future. And that was it. We had a, a, an important limitation in, in terms of production of medicine in Cuba. I mean, the, the items, uh, the medicine, the, the, the products, the vaccines. And uh, we invested heavily in developing bio, the biotechnology sector. Mm -hmm. uh, these days, it's, it's uh, impossible to, to face a, a pandemic like COVID without that, that strength. And thanks to that vision, uh, so many years ago, we have that sector able to produce the kind of pills, uh, the vaccines, mm -hmm. and other products uh, we need uh, locally. But again, the blockade is no doubt the, the most important limit. And it's important that uh, the participants in this web webinar understand that it not only harms Cuba, I mean, the, the effect is not only on our population, and it has a huge impact. No doubt we could do better without the, the, the blockade, but it has an impact on others as well. If we have, before the COVID, we have a medical presence in 59 countries all over the world, almost 30,000 experts all over the world mm -hmm. providing uh, those services. Without the, the blockade, would you imagine those uh, projects we have in so many countries with the possibility of using American technology, with the possibility of having American ex experts going with us to provide that service? Uh, we mentioned Ebola in Africa. Yeah. I have to say in Haiti also, we have some kind, not the same kind, but some kind of cooperation with American experts on the ground. But at that time, the political will was missing. I mean, that was not, that was not a political will to, to, to actually to develop a long-term uh, cooperation. It, without the, the blockade, the impact of what we do in Cuba in the United States would be huge as well. Uh, remember that in the year 2016, we signed an MOU on health. Yeah. Uh, it's there, it's still valid. At the time, uh, our Minister for Health, who is currently a Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Dr. Morales Ojeda, visited the United States. They met, uh, he met and his delegation met with uh, HHS uh, people, NIH uh, experts, this, most of the same guys now that are leading the effort against uh, COVID in the United States. And they, they sat around a table, and at the end, they, they were human beings talking about uh, mutual concerns, uh, headaches they, they have uh, as experts. When, if we talk about tropical diseases, you, you don't have frontiers for, for, for tropical diseases. I mean, you have tropical diseases. Yeah. And that affects everybody living in the, in the tropical area. And, and uh, probably for a human being in, in Maine, it's not that important. But uh, remember that Florida is probably the largest territory in, in the Caribbean. It's, it, yeah. it doesn't think itself as, as a country, but if we talk about tropical diseases, as we talk about uh, hurricanes, then uh, uh -huh. it, it has an impact in Florida and Georgia, Carolinas, Texas, uh, Louisiana, you, you name it, Alabama. Then when they visited, they were human beings, uh, officials from both countries, same concerns, same scientific ideas in how to get there, where do we go from now? They, they, they cover from AIDS to lung cancer, uh, things like that. Then at that time, we as countries, we envisioned 
the many things we, we could do. Afterwards, uh, year 2017, was signed the first, under this administration, it was licensed the first joint venture between Cuba and United States on health, because it's between the Roswell Fire Cancer Center in New York and SIM in, in Cuba, uh, one, of, uh, one of the institutions member of Bio Cuba Pharma Holding, to do a joint research on lung cancer and how to use the Simavax vaccine from Cuba to uh, enhance uh, the, the life of patients uh, who are at the last stages of, 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 of lung cancer. Your experts uh, discovered that with our vaccine, those patients could have a, a, a longer life with a better quality of life. Mm -hmm. uh, after the diagnosis, you have the best, you have five years. Where those patients in Cuba, they have 10 to 12 years with a good quality of life. Uh -huh. In many cases, they suffer of lung cancer and they die of something else, but not because of the, the cancer. That agreement is still there, it's unfolding. Your experts and our experts, they have shared information about diabetes and uh -huh. about heavy blood. And if you allow me to, to mention, simply by, by administering a heavy blood, which is a vaccine to heal the, the diabetes uh, food ulcer, we have been able to stop 73% of amputations in Cuba. Do you know how many you have in the United States every year? Mm -hmm. 60 to 70,000 cases a year. Uh, yes, yeah. Then we are now to focus on COVID, but if someone coming from Mars tell you, <laughs> you know, you know uh, Danny, we could stop next year 73% of the amputations in the United States. Imagine the social impact. Imagine the, the health impact. Imagine the, 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 even, even the, the resources you save by, by doing that. Then diabetes is an example. Cancer is an, is an example. What our experts are doing in Cuba, uh -huh. on, uh, brain mapping is amazing. I mean, the, the, the many things we could do together, and th that would have an impact on the United States, that would have an impact on Cuba. Then, I go back to the original idea that, of course, the, the blockade has an impact on the Cuban population in, in our national life, but indirectly it impacts also others and it impacts also the uh, United States. And no doubt, uh, mm -hmm. health is one of those sectors that suffers the, the most. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you know I mean, I, I, I can't imagine an ambassador to of a country or any other country except Cuba to speak so eloquently about their healthcare system and healthcare service. But you know, I would be re re remiss if I didn't, didn't, um, I would not, you know, call on and, and, and certainly the voices in my community, the African American community and people of color who've had an opportunity, whether they're they're of, of, of African descent or whether they're of, of uh, Spanish descent, who live in the United States, who have the opportunity to go to Cuba and study and study and learn medicine. And there's so many, uh, uh, Brother Lucius and, and the work that he did, and he continues to do with his daughter and all the kind of work that they've done on the ground in the US to kind of really sing the praises of the, the, the opportunities there uh, at, 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 the, at the school of the Latin American School of Medicine. And certainly, their voices is going to be heard in their communities where they work in the same capacity that others who work around the world in the service of bringing fundamental health care to people's lives and, they, and to applaud them. And I know they stand tall and proud from the fact that they were able to learn that lesson and, and to learn their lessons in Cuba and, and to take those lessons that they've learned in Cuba and translate those lessons into the positive impact that they have on their communities when they come back. And that's it. That kind of psychology, that kind of uh, that awareness, that kind of uh, generosity and spirit and service. Dr. King talked about service and, and the highest level of human engagement is service. And certainly the medical brigade in, in, in Cuba has demonstrated that not only in terms of its actual action, 
actual commitment and sacrifice often, but also because the Cubans train others to bring that same kind of ethic, ethical thinking to their own practice as well. And that's, the, that's, that's one of the unspoken aspects of what this is and what is happening here in a sense and changing the na narrative and changing our expectation. And here we are and possibility that we can as ordinary peoples, as ordinary citizens in our, strict, in our respective governments, as ordinary citizens, we can build the kind of international solidarity that's necessary to save humanity and to save the planet Earth as well. No doubt about that. Uh, well, you are based in a state like uh, California. As uh, I have to say that uh, human health has been a fundamental part of uh, in a program of uh, many elected leaders. I will not mention names, but uh, our doors are open in Cuba and you, many of your leaders, they know mayors from different cities, even governors uh, from several states. They have visited Cuba during the last years. And one important segment in the program in the island is about public health. I mean, how do you do this? Uh, what's the kind of resources we, we need to, to structure something like that mm -hmm. in the states, in our city? We have signed it, uh, bilateral agreements, uh, memorandums of understanding with uh, specific cities in the United States. And again, public health is, is a, a fundamental part of it. Uh, it's, it's part of the conversation. Uh, people are stunned when they see what, what, they, what we have developed, as I said, in biotechnology. That didn't come from one day to the next one. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if we say we are able to and hopefully we, we can share with you at some point what we have been able to create and produce. Well, among the best uh, leaders in that sector in Cuba, they came to, to American universities to study in the 70s and the 80s, many years ago, and they returned to Cuba. They have many friends in the United States. They, they know each other. Remember that our two scientific communities, they have known each other for 150 years. <laughs> the yellow fever was among those topics discussed many, many years ago. Then you have a scientific community in the United States that is pretty well aware about what we do in Cuba. Many times they publish articles, scientific articles together. They attend the same international seminars or international events. They, 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 they see issue. We have the blockade in the middle, but the blockade is not effective on, on knowledge. It's not effective on, on friendship. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have open communication with the people of the United States and you know being an activist and having visited Cuba so many times uh, members of the Congressional Black Caucus and, and elected officials in, in, in many cities in the United States how the, the way they have been welcoming in Cuba for many many years sharing your concerns uh, thinking about how uh, to help, and we have been talking today, uh, the day of launching this this campaign. We have been talking specifically on health, but we 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 can talk about education, for instance, and, and uh, education in general. I mean, and the kind of projects uh, we have developed uh, in the last four or five years. I cannot tell you because I don't know the number of how many university visits we have welcomed. In, in Cuba, not only young people going there to study, uh, and not only Spanish, by the way, uh, other, uh, in other faculties, but presidents of universities anywhere in the United States uh, going to Cuba. And nowadays, they, they have, you know, uh, something that they have produced uh, collectively. Uh, many books have been published with the uh, participation of uh, now I, I'm, I'm reading about the, the, the participants. Uh, we have, for instance, uh, being part of the seminar, Sergio Pastrana, who is uh, currently an ambassador in Barbados. He's a former president of the uh, Cuban Academy of Sciences. He published in the Science Magazine here a, a, a joint article with uh, an American scientist precisely on the history of, of uh, scientific cooperation between Cuba and United States. Then the blockade is there. The blockades affect us, but affect your communities and affect uh, your people as well. 
Well, I tell you, uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm reading some of these text messages that are coming in, and they're extraordinary. And then, like I said, whenever uh, the opportunity is there, that scholarships for for for, for students, it, United States citizens, to come to Cuba and study uh, medicine and create create the world that's possible, create another world that's possible. And that's what this is, that's what the Cuban healthcare service is about, creating another world that's possible. Not simply for Cubans, the Cuban people, but for all those. Uh, the, the idea that, that you, you can train doctors and, and transform the way in which they only see themselves, but their relationship to the world. And that is, that is a powerful statement to be able to that. And I, I can get some passionate over the ideas of, of that have happened and the, and the moments that I've experienced with graduate students who go on to gr graduate from the uh, Elon, who graduate from that and go on to do the work. And the surprise, the depth of their stories, because the depth of their experience of being there, learning Spanish for a year, and then going on into the med medical study and everything else, then finding the success they have within that and being able to, to replicate that in their lives. And you build another kind of confidence and self-confidence and worldview through that, that the, the, old, the whole thing around medicine. And, and, and certainly uh, it's, it's, it's been, uh, certainly I think we can talk and I know we'll talk on many occasions, we can talk forever on this, on this subject. And certainly also the fact that, that we have this opportunity to do everything we can to make sure that the, the brigade, that brigade, mind you, the Henry, the Henry Reed Brigade, Medical Brigade, has been in existence. It comes after and named after an American who fight, fought in the first liberation war from 1868 to 1878, he fought in the search, and that brigade shows the continual of connections that we have in, 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 in sustaining the sense of possibilities between us and relationships that can happen between us. And certainly, it, it, as we think about that work, the work that continues to be done is quite, quite extraordinary.